to episode 417 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Andrew Swafford. Paige Collier. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we're going to give you a second straight week of movies with unsimulated uh, fellatio and talk about 1976's The... In the realm of the senses, as part of Young Critics oh, Watch Old Movies. There's more than unsimulated fellatio. There is, but that's the through line between the two movies. The 1970s were brought to you by fellatio. <laughs> Speaking of being brought to you, Cinematary is brought to you by PB, Paps Blue Ribbon PBR. It says... Union made. It says, it says and I quote, Please d- cease and desist from reading any ad reads related to Paps Blue Ribbon or our subsidiaries on your podcast, Cinematary. This is the final cease and desist letter. If you continue with this, you we will be forced to uh, both fine you, your company, and anyone related to your company due to libel and dis- defamation. This is, a, once again, the last cease and desist from the Paps Blue Ribbon Company. Paps Blue Ribbon, the proud <laughs> sponsor of Cinematary. I feel like we're not defaming anybody here. I don't know what they're talking about. I can't read. All right, let's jump into movies that we saw this week. And uh, I'm going to go with Andrew first. Sure. Um, So this week I watched a movie that I was really excited to see at TIFF last year, but was not able to see at TIFF last year. Or because of a series of unfortunate events that kept me from actually attending the Toronto International Film Festival. Which, by the way, I don't know if we've announced on the podcast, we are going again this year. I'm excited. I think I threw it in as a as like a side during a break. So that's in just a couple weeks. That's exciting. But anyways, this movie uh, that I wanted to watch last year but instead watched this past weekend, um, Inu O. Um, I-N-U hyphen O-H. Um, the new animated film by Masaki Yuasa, um, who's kind of a, I don't even know if it's fair to call him an up and coming anime director. He's, he's kind of arrived. Um, (laughs) yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, this is a guy who I think got on a lot of people's radar, um, a couple years ago for his movie night is short walk on girl. Um, a movie that, uh, Paige's husband, Jordan, uh, turned both of us on to and, uh, fantastic like masterpiece of of modern animation Shout out Jordan. incredible incredible movie also, incredible man also, Jordan Collier. also yeah a ball he made a baller episode of adventure time for any of adventure time oh, fans I, I did not know great episode yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but i've seen a couple of his movies now i've seen night a short walk on girl of course that was my introduction to him i have seen mind game which was kind of an early success for him I've seen Lou on the Wall, um, and I've seen this new one, Inu O. I know he also made a movie a year or two ago called Ride Your Wave that I think Zach was kind of mid on. Is that right? Yeah, so my thing about Masaki Yuasa is that he is incredibly inconsistent. Um, Like, movie to movie... And then, like, within a movie, there will be scenes that I really like and scenes that I really dislike and choices that really feel like they work and then choices that really feel like they don't work. Um, The only movie that I feel like is a top-to-bottom success is Night of Short Walk on Girl, and the rest of his stuff feels all over the place. Um, And that is a thing that I think is going to be... Um, considered a positive that's a, it's a feature for a lot of people because that's kind of his style his style he doesn't necessarily have a like really clearly defined grounded style it's very like wobbly and goofy and chaotic he kind of comes from the like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Katamari Damacy like weird anime nonsense energy you know like that's that's what he's bringing to the table Um, Like Mind Game, for example, like jumps back and forth between a lot of different styles of animation. He uses stop motion and and claymation and and painting on top of like normal traditional like 2D hand-drawn anime. And his stuff is just kind of like bursting at the seams with energy and ideas and creativity and imagination. And like it's, it's really admirable, just like the ethos behind his stuff. 
Um, the problem for me is that often the stories do not come together um, in a way that is is like compelling or satisfying. Like Mind Game, which is maybe his most impressive movie in terms of animation, um, is a movie that I just like ab- just cannot get behind on a very fundamental level because it's it like when you boil it down, it's kind of about this you know personality devoid you know uh cliche anime male anime protagonist who just wants to like grope this woman who has cartoonishly huge boobs like that's what the movie's about right and he does lots of silly over-the-top things with the animation that it's easy to in the moment get swept up in but I don't care about this story and I'm actually actively kind of repulsed from it, right? Um, Lou Over the Wall is is just some kind of like Saturday morning cartoon nonsense. Did not enjoy that on any level. Um, Inu O, the new one, is is the closest I've gotten with Yuasa um, to another like unequivocal success. And um, I should say that the people that I went to watch this movie with, um, Jessica and Cam, who've been on the podcast uh, a lot, uh, especially Jessica, uh, really loved this movie. And like, if Jessica was here, she would give a very enthusiastic defense of some of the things that I'm going to say about it. But I still kind of liked this movie. Um, I, I, mo- I mostly liked this movie, but like, there are a lot of things that keep me from loving it um, in the way that uh, my friends have. But anyways, Inu O. Um, it is set in uh, feudal Japan. Um, it is about a guy who comes from kind of a rich family or like a, a noble family. Um, his his father dies very early on in the movie, and he becomes a priest, um, specifically what's called a biwa priest. Um, and a biwa is like a Japanese traditional instrument, um, kind of like the shamisen uh, that people that movie people might know from from Kubo and the Two Strings. It's kind of similar to that. Um, and the the biwa priests they you know go from town to town and they play music and they sing songs that are meant to kind of keep history alive they're they're telling stories of past military conflicts and and past peoples um, who have kind of been wiped from the earth at least that's what they do in this movie i don't know what all they did in history but but that's kind of how this movie depicts them um and there's another character, um, not the main character, named Inu O, the titular character, um, who has been cursed. Um, and his curse is that he has, um, he, he's like been deformed um, in ways that are, that are kind of um, left mysteriously undefined by the movie. Like he wears a mask for almost the entirety of the movie and the mask has holes in weird places and you can see eyes coming through the mask and you're not quite sure what this guy's face would look like with the mask off because of the strange places the eyes are. Um, And he also has one extremely long arm that is like three or four times the length of a normal arm, for example. Um, And Inu O is a great singer. Um, He is, you know, um, kind of considered an abomination. Uh, People people are afraid of him. They they keep their distance from him. But he's this beautiful singer. Um, And Inu O and our protagonist, whose name is... Timona, sorry, I had to look it up in Letterboxd really quick. Um, Inu O and Timona end up joining up and creating essentially a rock band <laughs> in in feudal Japan. Um, like they begin telling stories that um, are kind of related to Inu O's history. Like the reason why he's cursed, it has to do with this um, very. Uh, tragic war crime or, or, or military atrocity that happens to to a specific group of people, the uh, Haiki people. Um, and so they start telling the story of the Haiki people um, in a way that kind of runs contrary to the official government narrative about um, what actually happened to these people. Um, and they tell this story in this like really bombastic like arena rock 
um, style that is completely an anachronism uh, from the historical time period, but it, it's an anachronism in a way that that kind of makes sense emotionally and thematically, right? They're being rebellious, they're telling the truth that the 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 man doesn't want you to hear, um, and so they're they're you know doing this like really you know wild musical style to to communicate this, um, and a large 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 portion of this movie consists of just listening to them play these long songs where they they tell stories and kind of like hype themselves up and they're kind of creating this cult of personality around Inu O um, who's who's like considered this this musical genius this rock god right um, who who's mysterious and, and strange looking and and people are kind of drawn to him in this like magnetic way in the same way people were drawn to like Freddie Mercury or David Bowie or something like that um, and that's pretty much the story there's not a whole lot else to it um, you know you get you get a little bit of backstory at the very beginning before these characters link up and then the characters link up pretty early on and then they just start kind of playing music and telling other stories um, but that's kind of where the narrative stops um, and, and and my my main thing about this movie is that like aesthetically musically animation wise visually it is astounding it's amazing there's so many really cool uh, touches they do and so many really cool um, like visual territory that Yuasa branches out into like for example um, the main character I neglected to mention is blind and uh, he, he goes blind early on in the movie because of the thing that happened to his dad uh, when his dad dies and um, there are moments in the movie where you see through his eyes and you're just looking through a pitch you're looking at a pitch black image but when he hears things you see those things show up in the blackness in, in kind of this um, kind of glowing pastel, these glowing pastel colors. Um, and, and you're getting a sense of how um, somebody who is visually impaired in that way kind of puts together a mental picture of what they're looking at um, just through sound. I mean, it's really, really, really amazing. Um, like beautiful, um, like feet of animation um, what happens in those sequences and there's plenty of other sequences that I could describe as well um, but you know again aesthetically movie is kind of amazing um, narratively I got pretty like bored slash confused pretty early like it, it just kind of hits um, this this plateau and stays right there and and the music is engaging and and like there's a lot of cool dance cinematography that you get to see these animated characters do that is also really impressive um but that still wasn't enough to kind of like keep me in it for the full runtime um i should also say that like they return to the same well of like playing the same song basically like the same chord progression the same melody over and over and over and uh, they often dwell on that song for a very 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 long time um, and there were times where it just felt kind of tedious to me um, so I'm I'm positive to mixed on it um, I do think people should see it I think it's it's Yuasa's second best movie um, after Night of Short Walk on Girl um, and I think he is like a major talent in the world of anime, like major, major, major talent. I want to see him continue to make movies. I want to see him to continue to refine the kinds of stories that he tells. Um, but I ultimately wish this one worked for me a little bit more than it did. Um, so yeah, that's Inuo. It is uh, playing in some theaters now. It'll probably be on streaming sooner rather than later. Worth checking out, I would say. I wanted to see how long it take Andrew to clock that everybody's petting cats. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. I wonder where my cat is. I, sh- I should uh, I should bring him in here. Uh, cool. Yeah, you you also interest even even when it's not great, still interesting. All right, Paige, we're gonna send it over, and you're gonna take us back in time with a 90s classic as well as the original of the 90s classic yeah so uh, my sister gave me access to her disney plus account um and i've also been spending a lot of time babysitting my girlfriend's bird um 
and I'm using this bird to experiment with like different musicals to see what he really vibes to. <laughs> so I've just been kind of like a garbage disposal of Disney media uh, for the past few weeks. You gotta um, show the bird Inu O. I wanna know <laughs> what, what the bird thinks. He responds very well to chaos and violence. Uh, he <laughs> really loved Sweeney Todd. Um, <laughs> just seeing this little bird like freaking out over like rivers of blood was just fantastic. Um, but anyways, uh, so amongst my garbage disposal adventure, I uh, watched first Pollyanna, um, sobbed a bunch, remembered, oh yeah, I love this movie. I love Haley Mills. I'm going to watch The Parent Trap. And the exact same thing um, was just crazy about it. And I didn't think that I would be because the entire, I mean, if you don't know the story of The Parent Trap, basically it is, these two separated twins who had no idea they had a twin uh, wind up at the same camp, discover their twins, um, and then have this plot to um, switch lives temporarily and then get their parents back together and they can have they can be like one big happy family again. Um, and if you just look at that synopsis, that just sounds like nothing that just sounds like something that honestly sounds like a chaotic move to be like we're gonna get a divorce you take a kid well, i'll take a kid we'll never mention it to one another <laughs> and then really so go yeah. about our lives questionable <laughs> very yeah. questionable parenting yeah. um these parents so that... be trapped <laughs> exactly um but all of the jokes in the 60s one still hit it's all very genuine. There's no, I, I feel like I talk about this a lot, but there's a lot of like, there's this habit that movies do these days where like they want to have an emotional scene, but then there always got to be like, there always has to be a character going, well, that just happened to kind of break it up. Mm -hmm. um, but movies like, and from the sixties, were just so unapologetic. Like this is, th this is the feeling we want you to feel. We're just going to um, stay here and just be emotional and, you can take it or leave it and uh so that was really nice to just have this um uninhibited movie about like meeting these like a parent that you never knew you had and they turn out to be wonderful and just having this extended family and all of them love you like and it was just really lovely um and so genuine um and then I was like, what if I uh, revisited that 1998 one too? And that one also <laughs> slaps. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I think the, I, I am very fond of the direction and the authentic, authenticity of the emotions from the original, but the comedy in the 98 one is just so good. Um, the lady that plays Meredith is just a phenomenal villain all the the pranks that they play on her are just hysterical it's um it's just one of those movies where i feel like you have to be just a cold-hearted little gremlin to not think anything is funny you have the two like bisexual butlers that they each have for because for whatever reason they both have butlers they do both have butlers they're bisexual you can't tell me that they're not both you know swinging for both teams <laughs> which one are you talking about the 90 you're talking about the 98 one right yeah yeah you know you are so you are 100 percent correct i don't know if I <laughs> you are absolutely just correct. gaydars on the fritz <laughs> damn i was too busy just lusting over meredith blythe i guess but you are so right those are those are bicons for sure bicon butlers i just like that they both have butlers and they're both like I'm going to be into you, but also I feel like we're going to see people on the side. <laughs> yeah, hey, you're, right. Different you're right. Have you ever seen The Trouble with Angels? I haven't. Does it have it's Lindsay a, Lohan? No, it has Haley Mills. Oh. That's really? why I'm bringing it up. So it's, a, it's an Ida Lupino movie. Um, you know, major female filmmaker from Golden Age of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Um and it's about Haley Mills and this other actress, June Harding, um, who are both sent to a Catholic boarding school against their will. And they, they become best friends and, and rebel against the, the authority figures of their school. And it's adorable. I have uh, you got to it. see this. I yeah. love Haley Mills so much. She's mm -hmm. a precious button. 
Is she like 70 years old now? I don't know. Is she alive? Also, She's there. I, I forgot. Alive. I don't know if you guys remember that there's a movie called In It Takes Two by the Olsen twins, which is the exact parent trap. 76 mm -hmm. years old. She's still alive. 76. Yeah. Did you know that? Shout out to Haley Mills. Thanks for listening yeah. to our podcast. Did you know there's a Parent Trap 2 that came out in 1986? No. And the, 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 the plot is a girl asks her divorced mother's twin sister to flirt with another girl's widowed father. I'm sorry. It also has <laughs> Haley Mills in it. Yeah. Okay. I guess I need to watch all of Haley Mills filmography. Yeah. It's a large filmography. It I, probably not a great idea. <laughs> There's a Parent Trap three um, that came out in 1989. When Jeff plans to marry again, his triplet daughters Megan, Lisa, and Jesse try to bring him together with Susan. How many Wait, damn triplet kids daughters? Are okay, this this could have been an opportunity. Wait, is Haley Mills the mom in that one? What? Yeah, she gets Parent Trapped. She gets. I kind of want to watch all three of these. <laughs> it sounds like a. It sounds like a journey. Next, next, next series. series, Parent Trap. <laughs> it sounds great. Right. We do those three, and then we do the ninety one. The ninety. Yeah, and then one. we do the Olsen one. There you go. Mm -hmm. There we go. It's decided. <laughs> cool. Well, I, what parent? And the parent both of those, the sixty one and the ninety eight, use the same actress. Like they didn't have twins, by the way. And I look. They do a good job in both of them. Like I, th it's pretty seamless. Hmm. Just that, that's I thought it was cool, yeah. cool little fact. Yeah, I thought for a long time I I did I thought that there were two Lindsay Lohan, so it's okay. That's her first movie. She's so little. Yeah, I was like, oh, there's two of them. <laughs> oh, it's the first Lindsay Lohan movie. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's was a, she like a TV star before? No, she was just Lindsay Lohan. They were like, huh. she was just kind of roaming the, the parent streets. Trap really hit. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, oh, she was on a soap opera, and then she was on in Parent Trap. Uh, what really ended the, that. the first question on Google is what ended Lindsay Lohan's career? Um, wasn't it the extreme plastic surgery? Was that the reason? That some some court time things like that. It's, is it officially you know. ended? I don't think what? it's officially in it. She made a pretty good Paul Schrader movie. The Canyons. I like that movie. Yeah. I loved Freaky Friday so much. We should do we should do a Lindsay Lohan Cemetery series. Do Parent <laughs> Trap, Mean Girls, Freaky Friday, yes. Her Fully Canyons. Loaded, Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen. Yes, we should do that. Life, Life size. size. Yeah. I forgot about Life Size. Just just my luck with AB Chris Pine. <laughs> coming soon on cemetery she did that movie i know who killed me where the uh, the poster looks identical to the prestige <laughs> i have never heard of this oh man i saw it in blockbuster as a kid and i was like that's the prestige right and it was not the prestige I, 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 now i'm looking at it that's 100 percent like the prestige yeah like it, it's got to be intentional if it is that's hilarious i i approve <laughs> Life Size 2 in 2018. There so, was a Life Size 2? Just Man. a strong career from, from all LL, you know? And apparently she was also on Glee. I missed it. Oh, I don't, how did I miss that? We'll get into this Hear in the Lindsay out. Lohan series. Parent Trap series that transitions seamlessly into a Life into Size it. series. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought it was going to be Lindsay Lohan. Since it's her first movie, we just transition into the Lindsay right. Lohan series. <laughs> Yeah, and we all write about it in our diaries, and we post the episodes on MySpace. It's happening. I'm down. Yeah. Um, well, I believe the, all the parent traps are on Disney Plus. They are. If yep. you, if you or a bird that you know would like to watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to talk about two movies that piss me off, um, which seems like the energy we need to turn this podcast into. The first one is Uncharted. Uh, came out last year or earlier this year? No, earlier this year. I think it was earlier this year. 
Yeah, earlier this year. Um, it's on Netflix now because it kind of has the same energy as a Netflix movie. Um, it there's so I'll preface big big fan of the Uncharted video games. Um, they're not like world bending examples of video games but it's pretty much like what if we kind of took indiana jones and made it a and made like made you indiana jones i'm like yeah that's what anybody would want um and i'll give it credit that there are like the the interactivity of like the set pieces in in terms of video game mechanics was always um i always found to be i mean they're fun they're super super fun um this is not fun this is the opposite of fun. And it's a weird thing because like the video game is ba- the, that series is based off of movies. So it's like the movie to video game to movie thing. And so it's it's almost like because the movie is already it's like um fractions where um the the fact that movies already there it kind of cancels those two out and makes them bad. And so they've been trying to make this Uncharted movie, I think, for a minute now. Mark Wahlberg is in this movie and actually was originally supposed to play the lead character of Nathan Drake. Um, So instead, he's playing the partner, uh, Sully. Um, And I have nothing much to say on Mark Wahlberg in this movie. He's he's it it kind of feels like he showed up for a couple weeks and, as Mark Wahlberg and um, was on. They filmed him and then he left. Um and uh, the plot of this one, so you got Nathan Drake played by Tom Holland, um, who I'll get to him later. Um, who uh, <laughs> he uh, pretty much We're coming for you, Tom Holland. Well, it's like the whole thing is like there's a treasure, and Mark Wahlberg's like, hey, you gotta come get the treasure with me. And um, Tom Holland's like, okay. And they're like the other person getting the treasure is Antonio Banderas, who I'm happy got a good paycheck. Um, and, uh, a couple other people uh, outside of that, it's, there's not really any known, known, uh, 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 actors or actresses in this. So the treasure is some, it's like a, it's a shipwreck, uh, Mage- uh Magellan, his shipwreck with all his money. They're going to go find that. That's what the thing is. Um, it's, it, <sighs> I don't see how you can make a treasure hunting action of an adventure movie this boring, but director Ruben Fleischer sure gave it a, a whirl. Like I can't emphasize enough how, how like, t- like just you get tired during it. Like, like you're just yawning because you're just like, this nothing's happening here. There's a lot, well, there's way too much talking. There's way too much like setup. Tom Holland's just not a he's just not a good actor. Sorry to all the 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 young the young people into Tom Holland. He, I'll be honest with you, he's not a good actor in Spider-Man either. Um he's just got this really jovial um um I dare say theater kid, kid energy. It's like he's constantly he knows he's not impressive or talented and so he's like really working hard to make you think that he's impressive and talented. And it gets He's coasting off being on the cover of Non-Threatening Boys magazine. Yeah, and so it's just like, I don't know. Have have a personality, man. He doesn't have a personality. And, like, that's fine, but don't make him front a movie if he has no personality. Like, think about, for those who saw Top Gun Maverick, think about the the personality exuding from Glenn Powell in that movie. Just dude is dude is his musk. He's got personality as musk. <laughs> Love me some Glenn Powell. Tom Holland sits in in bed like the Wolverine meme, touching a picture of Glenn Powell, going, "I wish I had that musk of personality." <laughs> um, it's not here. I I can't even. I don't. It's one of those movies. I watched it recently. I don't remember anything that happened in this movie. I remember they made some cracks. I remember there was a couple action pieces that were embarrassing because the video game did a better job of it than this movie. Um, Do the cracks have a uh, "well that happened" like uh, deflation? Yeah, yeah to, thing? to Paige's earlier point, it's it's very um, it's very like Mark Wahlberg going, "What's going on here? What's up?" Um, at one point, he walks in. He's they're like in um, Spain, and he walks into like a pizza place, and he's like, "I'm literally in a Papa John's right now." Um, and you're just like, "Okay," 
And I just, it's boring. I think they're going to make a second one. It's boring. Ruben Fleischer, he looks like somebody who played a lot of beer pong and called somebody jabroni for three years in college and possibly still calls the person jabroni. And I'm glad that he's having a career, I guess. (laughs) Did you see Venom? No, no, I need to watch those. I heard. I I know a lot of people like Venom. I feel like that's more because of Tom Hardy and his chaotic energy. I like Venom. I I, I, I'm sure they're great. I'm not going to give Ruben Fleischer. I don't know if they're great, but I like them. (laughs) I think that's what most people who like Venom have to say about it. (laughs) Is it a good movie? It's a movie, and I like Tom. uh, Not Holland. Tom. I immediately forgot the other Tom. The other Tom. Well, Uncharted, it's on Netflix. If um, your sleeping pills aren't working, it is available. <laughs> um, let's let's t- let me talk about let me talk real quickly about a movie that I have deeply strong feelings about, and that is Road Runner, a film about Anthony Bourdain. Um, so, f- for I guess for those who aren't familiar with Anthony Bourdain's story, long time. Um, uh, was a chef, travel host. Um, in 2018, though, he committed suicide while they were filming his series Parts Unknown. Um, and so it was one of those things. It's one of those like celebrity deaths that I, I quantified honestly wasn't super familiar with Anthony Bourdain prior to his death. And then I just saw like the. I just it, it, it very similar to like how I reacted to um, Robin Williams and David Bowie, where you just saw like the 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 like the way people described what they meant to them that you were like oh like there must be something about this person and then you start engaging with what they created and you're like oh yeah this this is this is this is an incredible fascinating person um and so i started watching um i started watching parts unknown about a year ago a little over a year ago Um, and I just recently concluded it, which is why I watched the documentary. Um, and a real quick aside, parts unknown is probably one of the greatest, uh, television programs in the history of tele of TV. Like there's episodes of parts unknown that are just, just leagues better than anything being put in like multiplexes and movie theaters nowadays. Like and it, it's not even just like the stuff they, the original stuff. They, Bourdain also had like this rich appreciation and knowledge of of movies. I mean, there's a there's a whole episode late in the in the series where he goes to Hong Kong, and literally in the episode is Christopher Doyle, the longtime Wong Kar Wai uh, cinematographer, and they make this whole episode like paying homage to the to, to Wong Kar Wai movies and Christopher Doyle is shooting the entire thing and it's one of the greatest like hours of television you could ever watch um there's this episode in the second uh, season where he goes to Denmark and the narrative structure of it on top of the filmmaking is better than anything you'll probably find um in many places but that's on the side if you've never watched parts unknown i would definitely i would absolutely put like an emphasis on watching that at some point so i watched all of that have a like really responded to um bourdain and the way he thinks and the way he interacts with people and the appreciation and, and attention that he gives the people so then you have roadrunner which is the uh, documentary it's made by morgan neville who did the um will you be my neighbor what are the the mr rogers documentary um, and as I as I dig into the issues with this movie, I'm gonna also preface by saying that Morgan Neville should never be allowed to make another movie ever again. Um, this mo- the, so the documentary starts um, with uh, it, it pretty much documents um, Bourdain's career, but not from the start. Kind of when Kitchen Confidential, his his novel and his book that looks into. Um, like goes behind the you know behind the scenes of of kitchen kitchen life in New York City became like an international bestseller, and so it picks him up there through his his start in television and ends up you know in the final days of of Parts Unknown, um, and it features a lot of uh, a lot of 
familiar faces for people who have seen the sh- uh, who've seen episodes of the show, notably Eric Repair, the uh, French chef who appears in a lot of episodes with Bourdain, who was probably one of um, Bourdain's best friends, um, especially just you see their relationship through the program, uh, but also was the one who found um, Bourdain when he uh, had killed himself. And so... Um, you have Eric Repair who speaks, you know, very gently and kindly about his friend. But the movie, so the the first air that the movie, egregious air that the movie makes is there is a predominant use of voiceover. And I understand why they're doing it because you you have, if you watch Parts Unknown, you have the, you, you get so accustomed to the cadence, the, the language, the poetry of Bourdain's writing as he kind of narrates you through the episode and and takes you through these different places and so morgan neville is definitely trying to recapture that but let me you know a reminder anthony bourdain is dead at this point and so in order to create this rather than pulling from episodes or stuff or things like that he has an ai with anthony bourdain's voice read stuff that they wrote to carry along the narrative so that's that's egregious error number one. Egregious error number two is that the the back half of the documentary, probably the last 40, 45 minutes of this documentary, um, puts uh, pretty much posits that his girlfriend at the, at the time, uh, Aja Argento, is the reason is is. is possibly the reason why he killed himself and they spend the last 45 minutes literally trying to figure out why this man killed himself which not only is like a defacement to you know I, you sh- you should never spend any amount of time on a program of any sort trying to figure out why somebody killed themselves one two it's doing such a remarkably it's such doing a, such a remarkable disservice to somebody like Anthony Bourdain who would have been beside himself if he saw this thing that you would not like it, it shows a lack of, of, of understanding of like what he meant to people, how he engaged with people and what this program meant to a lot of people because he does this like you should you should focus on that you should focus on because clearly like when he died so many people were just outpouring with what 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 the program meant to them what um his interactions with meant with people the way he handled like interviews and questions with just this this generosity and this empathy is is par none and that's what you should be focusing on instead you spend 45 minutes trying to literally like a tmz investigator figure out why this man killed himself um and so I fucking hated it. Like, this is a piece of shit documentary. Morgan Neville sh- should never make another movie ever again. And, like, honestly, I'm just, like, a lot of the back half of this movie is also these crew members who worked with him kind of go like going yeah he could be an asshole he did this and that and the other we uh we really felt like this woman was manipulating him and like this is probably why he killed himself and like to have like to think of the betrayal like this person would have if he was alive to know that his friends spent you know almost an hour of a documentary about his life doing that like he like i think bourdain would vomit all over himself if he knew that and so that's Roadrunner. Do not watch it. Spend your time watching Parts Unknown uh, and uh, stay a long, like a, stay as far away from this documentary and Morgan Neville as you can. You still gave yeah. it at two and a half stars on Letterboxd. Yeah, I don't know. Numbers are, stars are meaningless to me. <laughs> that's how I feel. It's better, it's better expressed in words than stars. Always. Yeah, but seriously, if you've not watched Parts Unknown, you should. It's wonderful, and yeah, do not watch this documentary. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we will be back talking about In the Realm of the Senses after this.
And we're back with part two of episode 417 of Cinematary. In this part, we'll be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movie series with 1976's In the Realm of the Senses, uh, written and directed by Nagisha Oshiyama, uh, Oshima. Uh, the film stars Ieko uh, Matsuda, Tatsuya Fuji, and Ayo Nakajima. Uh, a former prostitute, now working as a servant, begins a torrid affair with her married employer. It is a fictionalized and sexually explicit treatment of a 1936 murder committed by Sada Abe. Strict censorship laws in Japan would not have allowed the film to be made, according to Oshima's vision. This obstruction was bypassed by officially listing the production as a French enterprise, of course, the French. And the underdeveloped footage was shipped to France for processing and editing. At its premiere in Japan, the film's sexual activity was uh, optically censored using reframing and blurring. Um, in, the, in the United States, the film was initially banned upon its premiere at the 1976 New York Film Festival, but was later screened uncut, and a similar fate awaited the film when it was released in Germany. It was also banned because of a scene in which Kichi pushes an egg into Sada's vulva, forcing her to push it out of her vagina before Kichi eats the egg. The film was not available on home video until 1990, although it was sometimes seen uncut in film clubs. Because of its sexual themes and explicit scenes, uh, the film was the cause of great controversy in Portugal in 1991 after it aired on public television station RTP. Some deemed it it inappropriate even for the watershed slot, while others appreciated its airing. The film aired again on RTP2, almost unnoticed. Uh, Oshima, uh, talking about obscenity in 1976, said, quote, The concept of obscenity is tested when we dare to look at something that we desire to see, but have forbidden ourselves to look at. When we feel that everything has been revealed, obscenity disappears and there is a certain uh, liberation. When that which uh, one had wanted to see isn't sufficiently revealed, however the taboo remains, the feeling of obscenity... uh, stays and an even greater obscenity comes into being pornographic films are thus a testing ground for obscenity and the benefits of pornography are clear pornographic cinema should be authorized immediately and completely only thus can obscenity be rendered essentially meaningless while on the supporting while uh while the supporting cast were veterans of adult film the two leads were not Kichi was played by Tatsuya uh, Tsuya Fuji, uh, a film actor who had acted in many of uh, Nikatsu's action films during the 60s. He had also played a part in the Gangster VIP series. Sada Abe was played by Yoko uh, Matsuda, who came from the world of avant-garde theater. Apart from a role in one of the Stray Cat films, In the Realm of the Senses was, was Matsuda's first and sadly only major film. While Fuji continues to act in films to this day, Matsuda was vilified by the media thanks to In the Realm of the Senses and never had much of a film career after it. She passed away in 2011. The New York Times reviewing the film in 1977, I, like, I just have to add the headline for this, which is In the Realm of the Senses is rated W for Y. Um, it's impossible to see a painting if your nose is squashed right up against the canvas. Even with the contemporary pleasure and turned up volume, there is a point at which music is so loud it can't be heard. Excessive visual shock will turn an audience's attention attention from any other quality a movie may possess and center it exclusively on its own pain. Nagisha Oshima's film about sexual obsession in the realm of the senses was not, in fact, doing very well when in the last couple of minutes he turned the volume up. It had become tedious, repetitive, its limited strengths had long since been exhausted from overuse and in those last couple of minutes a trying film became an intolerable one i am using the word intolerable as a critic and not to justify the united states customs ban on the film last fall senses does not show up show anything that has not been available in hardcore porn houses around manhattan except an undeniable uh, uh except an undeniable though i think poorly used artistic imagination on that note, let's talk about in the realm of the senses. Um, Paige, you 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 got all the notes, all the inside. So before we get to that, what did you think of the movie? Okay, I didn't like the movie. <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you. It was a really unpleasant experience, and I was very let down. I think I had in my head that I was going to watch some erotic art. Um, because the poster was so good and I, I looked at all their reviews and Letterboxd did that thing where everyone was like, it's a masterpiece, blah, 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 change nothing, darling. <laughs> I believed them 
Um, so I went in so excited and I watched it with Andrew and I kept looking over at him like, are you also having a terrible time? <laughs> and I was. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is a shame because I thought a two hour movie about sex would be really fun or at least interesting at the very least. But I was bored. Unsimulated sex for two hours was boring. <laughs> I wanted it to stop. I needed it to stop. <laughs> I kept saying, I hate this realm. I want out of this realm. <laughs> That's what the, uh, the the workers at the different hotels were probably saying. They were well. definitely saying. They were just like, will you stop, please? Like, I, I'm not getting paid enough for this. <laughs> you know, Biden and the inflation, like, I can't do this. So, like, we just want to pick up some socks. Maybe take your sock air away, please. <laughs> do, do you want your socks? No, we like it there. All right, well, shit. Like, <laughs> Um, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew, what did you make of this movie? Oh, I mean, I, I also had a horrible time. Um, <laughs> it's my main, my main takeaway. Um, me and Paige were like continually commenting upon like the quality of the sex that we were seeing. On oh my screen, gosh. Which was, which was just horrible, right? Like most of the 10 with that one. <laughs> He would less just, than six he would just put it in and that was sex he just puts it in you know or or <laughs> she just sits on him and like they just, just sit there together and and that is the thing that is apparently driving these people so wild <laughs> that they end up <laughs> killing each other basically <laughs> and uh, you know zach you said the thing um, in your fact sheet about how apparently everybody involved was was like a, a porn veteran except the two leads yeah like that's wild to me. Um, like maybe it's an artistic choice or something, but like these people are not good at having sex on camera. Um, she, she's and, like a theater nerd and he was an actor, like a celebrated actor. Wow. And so yeah. like, I don't know. I feel like another version of this movie might involve um, like kind of enticing the audience a little bit, like getting them at least a little invested in the relationship or or at least help them understand the mindset that the characters themselves are in. Yeah. But like, it just doesn't compute to me that these people are like murderously horny for each other, but like, don't seem to know how to have sex. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't, it, it was uh, unpleasant to watch. So you asked in the middle of it, whether you, you were wondering if the director thought that this was sexy or not. And mm -hmm. I did a bunch of diving and he did not want it to be enticing. He sure. wanted it to be like yeah. at all. He wanted it to be as far from porn as possible. And I think he succeeded in that because I was very bored. But like, um, why exactly? Like Because um, during the time he was doing this huge battle with censorship and he uh -huh. wanted, and they were saying it's about obscenity. It's not about, uh, trying to suffocate art. It's about obscenity, and what you're doing is is obscene. He's like, well, why don't you define obscenity to me? And they're just saying, well, if the audience is, di is disturbed, then it's obscene. So he's like, well, if I take the subject matter and make the audience not disturbed, it is no longer obscene. So he just wanted us to be so bored with the idea of sex that it no longer becomes obscene. See, boredom um, was the point? Like, he, he said that? Yes. Well, not boredom, but he didn't want it to feel titillating. He just wanted it to feel like, oh, well, this is just well, another part of the movie. I, I feel like titillation is on one side of a spectrum and disturbed is on the other side of the spectrum. And I feel like he does at times get to that side yeah. of the spectrum, like just through the sheer repetition of it. Like he, it's almost like what Paul Verhoeven does in Showgirls with nudity. Yeah, he makes you totally desensitized. Exactly. To yeah. However, his one of his goals was to make you like desensitized to the sex, but to really care about the characters. Because he said at the time, like I think it was called like pink porn or something like that. The uh, pink soft film? pink film, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, was like a like a big deal. And he he always felt that the characters felt very cold and lifeless. So he thought that he would make you care about the characters, but I don't think he succeeded at that personally. For sure me. didn't. Yeah. I didn't care These about people, the characters at I all. Yeah. I, I wanted them to go, <laughs> just leave <laughs> us alone. Um, 
But I did like it. And he was very purposeful in all of his filming. Like he made sure the camera was like we were up in there because he wanted us to feel like we were part of it. But it's weird to like, like, I want you to feel part of it. But like, I didn't I didn't want to be in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, was well, like, I felt very suffocated. It feels like um, there's these two conflicting impulses. Like he wants you to be like up in there. He wants you to not be able to avert your eyes from what you're saying. Yeah. But he also wants you to be repulsed from it at the same time. Yeah. Like he doesn't yeah. have any like. Oh, he doesn't have like lingering shots, I think, of body parts like a lot of porn does. Where you're like, look at these tits. Like, yeah. there's there's none of that. You you see the two of them most of the time, um, and he always made sure their genitals were on display at all times. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was fascinating, and also just the way that they shot it was very like like risky. Um, they knew that it was not allowed. Um, so they booked this location and filmed in total secret and at like, and they did it all in a matter of weeks. Um, and they couldn't like review their film. Like at the end of the day, they had to ship everything off to France for it to be, um, you know, like you said, like it had to be made in France. Of course the French get involved, you know, <laughs> they have oh, to be. Oh, is it perverted? Oh, <laughs> it over here. <laughs> so uh, it took, three years of planning and then they did it um just to prove this point about like how things are obscene because people make it obscene it's not actually obscene so it's it's really all like a meta political thing about the japanese film industry it's not really about sex at all it's it's not he's a majorly political filmmaker most of his stuff is centered around politics um yeah. and if you pay attention to things other than the very boring sex throughout the film like they're in the middle of like i think there's a war happening and mm-hmm. they're always going in the opposite direction of soldiers or they're like just in their own they're in, specifically in their own little world why while there is chaos around them and he mm-hmm. said the point of this movie was to take a look at these two people who were trapped in this social structure with no way out. So they just like get obsessed with each other because this is the only form of freedom that they have to the point where they destroy each other. And that on paper sounds so awesome to me, but I didn't feel that in the movie. And I don't know if I was just like not well, for it or I don't I don't think it's a failure of your perception page. I feel like we're so zoomed in on these characters that yeah. we don't get a sense of the social strata around them, right? Yeah. I know that there are some soldiers in a couple of scenes. Yeah. But I couldn't tell you anything about that military conflict because the the movie doesn't dwell on it. And no, also, you get the you get the one scene where he's like walking down the alleyway or the street or whatever, and you have the soldiers, and he and like you just get this kind of very like silent scene where he's like kind of averting his attention and and looking away from him. But that's literally the entirety of the yeah, entire movie. We're supposed to glean all of that in those few sequences, and also like there's um, I don't know if you realize this. I had to I had to look over it. Um, the sequence where she, where uh, Sada is just laying there, where a little girl is like running around playing, that's mm-hmm. a dream she had of a little girl version of herself. Had no idea how we were supposed to get that. And then oh. there, there was also the part where she grabs that little boy's penis and hurts him. That was also yeah. a dream sequence where she dreamed of hurting children. What? How much yeah. does he think it's a dream sequence? I don't Oshima? know. It did not feel like a dream sequence because he didn't use, like, he insisted on not using any kind of transitions except for hard cuts. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. He said that was too pornographic to use anything. He said dissolves are pornographic. So I feel like somebody who uses the word pornographic as a derogatory term should not be making this movie personally. Yeah. Um, He just wanted to stay away from porn. And I don't know. And also the story of Sada Abe is just so rad. Um, Like the, it's just such a fascinating read. Um, She, this was based on a true story, 1930s Japan. Um, this woman who has had a horrendous life, a little girl that dreamed of being a geisha, um, whose parents treated her off awfully. Uh, she was 
raped at a young age and became rebellious and uh, they sent her, his, her father sold her to a brothel and she tried many times to escape the sex worker life but couldn't because you're just kind of stuck in that cycle once you get in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she finds this man and becomes completely obsessed with him because he was so set on pleasing her. He was so set on doing whatever she wanted and no one had ever treated her that way. Um, not how it comes across. In I world, know it yeah. doesn't like she talks so much like in her, like the quotes that you see, she talks so lovingly about this man. Like he would do anything for me. He was the most skilled lover I'd ever had. And I was like, what? They didn't do that in the movie at all. He's, he's he actually just, actively rapey. Yeah. He's super rapey. Um, so and she loved this guy so much that whenever her story hit the public, like there was public sympathy for her because they felt like she had done it out of love and not jealousy. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever she was um, in front of the judge or the police, I don't remember exactly, but she said that um, I wanted to kill him because I knew that we couldn't be married. And the only way I could really love him if I was the only person that loved him so I killed him. Um, and everyone thought that that was like they were empathetic towards it. And it, But it was also in the midst of this huge wave uh, called uh, Eroguro Nonsensu, which I'm sure I just butchered. But that means um, uh, like ero- erotic, uh, shoot, where'd it go? Erotic, grotesque nonsense. Hmm. Yes. So in the middle of erotic, grotesque nonsense being a trend and also in the midst of war. Wait, wait, can we can we back up erotic, grotesque nonsense being a trend? Can can we explain what exactly that entails? I I, what at the time they're producing a lot of media that was just sexy, gross and weird. Um, I would love to I would love to know more. I don't currently. Um, But that paired with a desperation of the public to hear about anything except poverty and war this headline hit and everyone was like fuck yeah this bitch is crazy i love her um, is it like the uh, the japanese one of the oj simpson trial or something <laughs> I, you know what <laughs> it, it, it is eerie um but yeah she only served five years in prison she was uh, excused by the emperor he was like you can go wow all good who horny lady oh yeah she even wrote an autobiography like there is um there's another movie about her by the one and only nobuhiko obayashi um that i would like to see um and there's a review on letterbox from uh the critic kristen yansu kim um who's who writes in the realm of the senses walked so sada could run um so so that's the one that we should watch. I do want to watch all, anything about Sada, anything about the parent trap. It's on my watch list. <laughs> <laughs> the sad thing is after this movie was released, um, the actor that played Kichi went on to have many more successful films, but the actress, and I would, uh, would love to know her name. Uh, Iko, Iko Matsuda, um, was villainized for it. Um, and she didn't uh, didn't do anything like in film ever again, and that's just a really awful double standard. But I guess that's to be expected mm-hmm. from the seventies, right? Yeah. So I, uh, I just think the story it was inspired by and the way that they made it is so fascinating. I just wish it, wish it was an enjoyable watch. Can we? Um... Just wasn't. like Paige, maybe you could get on this soapbox with me real quick. Okay. Um, Cause this is something that we commiserate on uh, uh, frequently. Um, like m- eroticism in movies is done so poorly, right? Just like in general, right? I Usually, totally agree. Movies that include like, you know, dwelled upon depictions of sex um are almost always doing so in kind of a sex negative way i don't get it like um it maybe it comes from some desire on the part of filmmakers to be cynical or to be edgy or something like to tell the hard truths that people don't want to know about the human condition or whatever but like it just it kind of sucks for this this medium that like a visual medium that is like so 
um, I don't know, well suited for like depicting human sensuality. Yeah. Um, to to like so rarely like actually I, let the audience enjoy that, right? I mean, uh, in most cases, erotic films are like erotic thrillers. They're like these. Mm-hmm. The protagonists are evil, and their need for sex is evil. Well, and well, you were on this episode page but i think i think a good modern example um is is the handmaiden in terms of like the trading between two people of like having a uh not necessarily erotic but just like a like you felt like a deep connection through through you know through the sex rather than just being like here are two hotties on the on the screen to make you you know go crazy it's like no it's like it seems like an actual partnership on screen it was that that's a fantastic way to go about it that was like sex through the lens of a love story in my opinion and most films don't do that Mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of the time i mean it, it i'm sure it's more complex than this but a lot of it comes down to just it, it, I think maybe it's not necessarily used for the story. It's more just used for the 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 reaction. And maybe that's what uh, Oshima is, is kind of getting at, is that it's a lot more like the, the, you, if you have, you know, uh, a nude woman or a nude man or just anything on screen, it's more just to kind of elicit a reaction about like the taboo rather than the actual act itself. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that's just kind of a function of, I think it's just kind of a function of, of maybe uh, it's tough. Cause it, it partially it's, it's because of codes, not, not even just the, the censorship codes, but like production, the, you know, the Hayes code and things like that, like having to get around that. And so it seems like, even though to your point, Andrew, that it seems like a medium that could um, elicit itself to like having these really strong, erotic scenes because it's been so tethered by codes and rules and laws Mm -hmm. it's it's much more adept at doing like the 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 entendres and the yeah the oh yeah the subversion but also the entendres and the innuendos and like you know think of how many pre-code and code films like they're having sex but it's more about like the conversation or think something like that rather than actual physical anything right um like romance is such a staple in film like almost any like pick any genre even if it's not a romance movie like a lot of time the the through line the the thing that is emotionally compelling for the audience is like you want the two leads to get together but anytime we're we're watching the movie where like the two leads are together and we're, we're getting to see them like uh, share physical intimacy intimacy with one another like we always have to like show the like dirty underbelly of that for some mm-hmm. reason um I, I don't I don't get this this weird trend in in like just cinema as an art form. I don't know. Maybe I'm painting with way too broad of a brush here, but I, I feel like I can name like way too few movies that actually like allow the characters or the audience to like enjoy this like very big part of just being a human being. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's it's weird. I think the uh, sex for romance definitely is supposed to be this very floaty, dreamlike kind of yeah. sequence. You're not allowed to experience pleasure, really. It has, or, or there's like a cap on it, you know. Right. Otherwise, it's dirty. It becomes um, too much. It's yeah. Too much. Well, are, and are we talking about? I guess what type of films are we talking? Are we talking about like American-made movies? Because I'm like that probably just comes back to just the puritanical nature of. Of America and kind of that whole, mm-hmm. just kind of where we're we're built from. Um, I feel like you probably get a little bit more freedom in in you know French films or you know, even Spanish language films. You know, like look, even though this is a this is a, a Japanese film, um, that's also a pretty puritanical uh, culture for the most oh, part. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wonder, I, I wonder also like it, it would be interesting to take a broader brush and look at just how whether it's French or German or, or Spanish, like how those are also, how, how, how eroticism and sexuality is is um, portrayed in like films there. Uh, to sort of go back to my original point about like a different version of this movie, what this, what this might look like instead if it allowed the characters to 
like I would allow the audience to actually get into the mindset of these characters. You know, I feel like Oshima kind of gets in his story's way by making this into strictly this like shocking political statement. Um, when if you're telling a story about Sada, you know, based on the the story that you told, Paige, yeah, it seems like the way to get inside that character's head is to show how much she likes it, right? And yeah. to make the audience feel like they like it as much as she does on screen, yeah. right? And then you have the cognitive dissonance of like, you know, her jealousy and her rage and, and all that stuff that kind of comes bubbling up. Um, in the last act, but I don't think any of that stuff works if I if I hate watching the sex for the uh, the two acts leading up to that. I mm. agree. I think I mean if his if he thought well if the audience is tit- titillated that means it's obscene, then I feel like his definition of obscenity like has right. some some room to grow. Then was yeah, this, I mean, this is, is way obscene? more obscene yeah. than like an actually erotic film. I think yeah. I don't that I go around throwing and like if you so if he dared to make Sada's um like pleasure and uh, desire for him more realistic that's obscene yeah I don't know yeah <sighs> circles also I, as I was talking um and and how he said that he didn't want the audience to he wanted it to kind of feel sterile and desensitized well then why add in like seems like the egg and <laughs> Like, also the scene why of him upset di- me dipping his food in her pussy juices uh, because that's what they say they say that if you want a long lasting relationship you gotta eat food dipped in your lover's pussy juices yeah and- <laughs> as you do yeah <laughs> That's what I've heard. There, there was another. Ex- there, there was like two expressions in there. He's like, "It feels best when the bladder is full." And yeah. Like, oh my Who god. Who says this? That's what and they say. And then she was like, "I can't wait. You just have to pee in me. Just pee inside me." <laughs> god. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of comes down to they're kind of just two annoying people. They're annoying. They really are. They're yeah. So annoying. <laughs> I don't think this is the couple the emperor pardoned. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah, no, I think, like, I think uh, they just kind of suck, you know? <laughs> annoying, I think, is a very uh, gentle word for it. Like, they are, you know, to be a little bit more uh, forceful, disrespectful to other people who don't want, did not consent to watching them have sex. Also, and he straight like, up likes people. That's what I was going to go next. Straight up, like, abusive to other people um she just like sticks him on people and he just rapes people because she tells him to i'm kind of like so i I had just read these articles and like what his intentions ones and now as i'm going over it i'm like my opinion is changing i'm mad again (laughs) i'm circled back to mad (laughs) do you know if any of that stuff is true Paige? about like the 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 assault and stuff about whether this character assault well he i from what i understand this guy had a reputation of being a woman eater so i'm guessing yes but i don't have i don't know for sure right yeah hmm. yeah i don't know i was bored i was bored yeah. too it's bored it was a long two hours. <laughs> <laughs> this was my my pick for uh, young critics. I apologize, everybody. Yeah, uh, it sucks, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and I bring up the point I brought up at the beginning. What, the, why do we plan two straight movies with just unsimulated blowjob scenes? You know, what was the other one? Pink flamingos, pink flamingos last week. There's unsimulated like, blowjobs. Yeah, it's it's, it's just no like. Good? It's like the seventies. It was just like everybody, like we're, we're filming the blowjobs. Everybody just whip it out, y'all. Yeah, as <laughs> cemetery fun. He just he puts it in. <laughs> that'll be a fun. That'll be a fun one that I'll not remember until next week's episode. <laughs> um, any final thoughts on the movie before we wrap up? Um, it is available to those I guess interested on the Criterion Channel. Um, so when you finish, you know, art house classics, you can watch really annoying people have sex for two hours. <laughs> I 
watch the Obayashi movie, which is also on Criterion Channel. That's what I'm doing, for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we list all the movies that we talked about in this episode. If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash cinematary. Uh, and, you know, whether it's $1, $5, whatever, we appreciate any sort of uh, support. Thank you to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Corey Willingham, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marsathi, Titus Arthur, and Tyler Chandler. Thank you so much for your patronage. Uh, next week we're going to be continuing our Young Critics Watch Old Movies series but we've got two two episodes left uh, this one is 1988's Heathers so uh, dive it into an old an old classic yeah because um, despite um, a culture that's saturating us with 1980's nostalgia the 80's were a while ago so get over it I'm just going to let that linger Till next week. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you then. Bye.